Um, good evening. I'm really excited for this program. I'm really thrilled that we're able to do this. My name is Indra Mungle, and I am the <laughs> thank you. I am the community engagement person for the Asian Art Museum. Um, my position is new, and a lot of people ask me what this position did before, but we're creating it here, and you see it now. Uh, we are, the museum is really looking, embarking on deepening our work with the community. And we've done a lot of work with the community over the years, but we're looking at deepening and broadening that. I partner a lot with the museum's education and public programs team. As a matter of fact, we collaborated on this program tonight. And um, they've been working with the community for a very long time on their, public, on their programs. And, um, there are various events. <clears throat> this is my nervous excitedness voice. Um, so uh, anyway, some have asked us why we're doing this program and what, why we are hosting this dialogue. This is really relatively new territory for us. Our program topics are generally, as many of you know, are related. But we're hoping that the museum can provide a safe place for discussion about sensitive issues. We seek to, to host this place where people can come and learn and have discussion and debate and uh, have multiple perspectives presented where they are welcome and heard. And we can hear from and learn from each other. The goal of tonight's program is to articulate connections between the experiences of Asian Americans and African Americans using the current civil rights crisis as the springboard for this discussion. We thank you for joining us tonight and for sharing your feedback at the end of the evening. Uh, many of you have evaluations on your chairs, and if not, we have more in the back. But this is where you can tell us, what did you think about this program? What sort of topics would you like to see us address? We need to hear from you, and we are listening. Definitely we're listening and I'm listening. Uh, we are, uh, we are, oh, I'd like to direct your attention to the back of the printed program. We've got many great events upcoming. One of them, I don't know if many of you saw the beautiful uh, installation, art installation actually down on the lobby uh, ground floor by Sanaz Mazinani. It's gorgeous contemporary artwork and you can walk through and experience it. And uh, April 16th, we'll have a program that she's, uh, that's about her artwork. So now I'd like, I'm pleased to introduce <laughs> our moderator for the evening, William G. Wong. Bill is an author, a journalist. He's ha he had a long running regular column in the Oakland Tribune and was featured in other uh, media journals. He is currently writing a book about his father, an immigrant from China during the Chinese exclusion era. So I'm happy to introduce Bill. Welcome. Thank you very much, Indra, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. A recent article in the New York Times about President Obama going to Selma, Alabama to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the famous civil rights march over the Edmund Pettus Bridge used the following phrases in its first paragraphs. Bipartisan by racial testimony. Black and white newsreel black and white reality. Notice, please, only two colors, black, white. It is certainly true that Selma and the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century were primarily black and white. But a lot has changed in those 50 years, and a lot has not. The black-led civil rights movement sparked liberation movements among Americans on the margins, including we Asian Americans. Asian Americans and other Americans owe a deep debt of gratitude to black Americans for leading the way toward greater social and racial justice. 
Barack Obama's election in 2008, some of us thought, might bring an end to racism in America as we knew it, if that were only the case. Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Ferguson, Staten Island, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and yes, San Francisco. People in places that remind us that racism did not end with Obama's election. Black Lives Matter has become the iconic hashtag of our time, symbolizing the state of American racial justice. But is Black Lives Matter only a black and white issue? Where do Asian Americans fit in in the American racial justice landscape? Those are two of the questions we want to explore tonight, but there are others. How do Asian Americans feel about Black Lives Matter? Where are the Asian American voices, and what are we saying or not saying about racial justice? Are we aligned with black Americans on racial, racial justice issues? And where are we not aligned? Do we Asian Americans have our own racial justice issues? And if so, what are we doing about them? How do we deal with stereotyping, racial profiling, fear, safety concerns? Self-interest versus common interests. What I find interesting is that the historical narratives about, of Asian Americans and black Americans have similarities. Both our communities have experienced profound institutional racism and brutal violence because of state-sanctioned racism. But our American experiences are not always the same. We have a very distinguished panel of thinkers and active to help us find our way through this political, cultural, and social thicket. And we want to do it in an honest, provocative, and respectful manner. The panelists and I will spend the next hour or so discussing these issues. Then we will take questions from you in the audience. Let me briefly introduce our panelists and you can read more fully their impressive credentials in the printed program. Alex Tom is executive director of the Chinese Progressive Association. Mm -hmm. Brought your fan base, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Carissa Lewis is a radical black urban farmer and community organizer <laughs> from Oakland. <laughs> Nadia Kostegir has been an act has been active in social justice movements for several decades. And uh, Jeff Adachi is the public defender of the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, I, want to, I want to start with you, Alex. Um, why should Asian Americans care about Black Lives Matter? So I prepared uh, statement and before I jump into that question I do want to thank the Asian Art Museum for having us here today and really honored to be on this panel and really taking on this question is really important right now because it shows how much the current moment right now is creating space and making space for us to be able to talk about race and our collective path to freedom. I want to say a little bit about myself and who I'm trying to bring into this room. 
I'm born and raised in the Bay Area, San Francisco, South Bay, uh, Fremont. Y'all know where Fremont is? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I rep hard. Um, organized and went to school for nearly 10 years in San Diego by the border region. And then I've been at the Chinese Progressive Association for the last 11 years. So the folks I want to bring in the room are the thousands of stolen lives that have been shot and killed by the police. I want to bring in the room the family of Errol Chang, who's actually sitting right here, an unarmed Chinese man who was shot and killed by Daly City SWAT just a year ago. I want to bring in the room the people before us, the freedom fighters, the shoulders we stand on. I want to bring into the room the people that raised me the chosen and non-chosen family, queer, black, and brown women, immigrant workers, the young people. I want to bring into the room my newborn son, who makes me think every single day what kind of future we're building for him and his generation. And I want to bring into the room the inspiration, the courage, the love, and hope of this current moment. I feel very blessed and very grateful that the Black Lives Matter movement is making black lives and black liberation an everyday kitchen table conversation. And we're breaking out of those silos tonight. We're breaking out of our generations tonight by having this conversation, and it's transformative for us as we speak. But I'm not going to lie, there are a lot of challenges. These are challenging times. And just to the question, I have three basic reasons for why Asian Americans should support black lives. The first one is, is really basic. It's our responsibility, especially like in the Bay Area where you have San Francisco where it's 38% Asian. The Bay Area is 25% Asian. We are indirectly or even directly displacing traditionally black communities across the board, middle class, working class folks. We must be visible in our solidarity and show up for black people, period. The second reason is that it's actually about us. It is about us. BLM, Black Lives Matter, is building a movement. It's creating political space for us to be able to talk about the marginalization in our own community. Like I said about Errol Chang, who had a mental illness, their case was not received with a lot of support from the Asian community, and actually, mostly, or not surprisingly, from the black and brown community. So what does this say about Asians, Asian Americans showing up for our own people, right? People always say Asians show up for Asians, and that's actually not even true. How do we show up for our own people who are marginalized in our own communities, like queer and trans people, Arab and Muslim folks, refugees, Southeast Asians? So the third, third reason, I would say, is like if we don't organize our people, others will. And of course, there are a lot of anti-black racist tendencies within our own community, and we have to recognize that. We got to work on it. You got to talk to our parents, our families. We can't just only talk to other people, um, activists, right? But there are also right-wing forces that are exploiting these divisions and tensions. I want to give an example in New York, and I'll say more about this later. But Akai Gurley, who was a father who was unarmed, a black man who was killed by a Chinese police officer, Peter Liang. Liang was recently indicted, not convicted. And there's been an outrage, mostly from the Chinese community, to quote unquote drop, drop the charges since the white cop never got indicted. So there have been over 120,000 people who have signed this petition, a White House petition. 2,000 people showed up to a rally to support the cop. And, um, and, on, uh, and on April 26th, they're planning to have national rallies in eight cities. Um, not here, of course, but <laughs> Los Angeles, Silicon Valley, uh, Philly, Boston, New York, Ohio, and Texas. But I just wanted to like, lift that because behind the veil of all of these things, people have stereotypes of Asians saying like, oh, these are all these Asians against the black people. But let's look behind the veil, let's follow the money, and you'll see that there have been major support by Republicans and real estate and corporate interests. So we really need to organize our people because if we don't, others will. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, 
Uh, Carissa, two questions actually. Would you explain from your perspective what Black Lives Matter means and offer a viewpoint about what, if anything, Asian Americans should do or care about Black Lives Matter? Cool. Um, how y'all doing this evening? Cool, cool. Um, so I'm Carissa, like he said, I'm a radical black farmer from East Oakland. Um, and BLM, Black Lives Matter, um, was a rallying cry for black folks, right? So um, the call was put out following the non-indictment um, of the murderer of Trayvon Martin, or the, the acquittal, excuse me. Um, and so one of my sisters, a woman named Alicia Garza, um, posted on her, she was noticing on her Facebook page that a lot, a lot of black folks were like, we knew he was gonna get off, this is normal, right? Um, and she put the call, she, she made the statement that black lives matter, right? That we should continue to be surprised every time our lives are devalued in this system. Um, and so that was the impetus for Black Lives Matter. Um, it grew steam after um, the uprisings in Ferguson. Um, and what we're saying is that all lives should matter in theory, right? But they don't. In reality, um, black lives are devalued at every junction, right? When we're talking about every system, we have the worst um, outcomes, right? When we're talking about the economic system, when we're talking about our healthcare system, when we're talking about our educational system, black folks are always getting the crappy end of the stick. Um, and so Black Lives Matter was a rallying cry. It was a cry to say that we will value ourselves and we will demand that other folks value our lives as well. Um, so that's what Black Lives Matter is, and I've been honored and humbled to throw down with folks um, over the last seven, eight months in the name of Black Lives Matter. Um, and I've been really humbled by our co-conspirators, um, Asians for Black Lives and um, the Third World for Black Power, which are two groups that I've had um, the privilege to work with in the Bay Area. Um, and the reason why I believe that it is important for Asian folks to throw down with us um, is because your liberation depends on it in the same way that my liberation depends on it. We are all fighting a system that does not respect or value our leadership, our gifts, our talents. And as long as we continue to buy into this system, we will continue to put our lives in jeopardy. Um, and until we are able to stand together and fight together, we will not see our liberation. Um, and, you know, Asian folks have been used as a wedge um, in, in while we have been fighting for our liberation. Um, and one of my favorite phrases is model minority mutiny, right? That folks are standing up and saying that that's bullshit. Um, and that together, we're going to be able to create a world where we all get recognized and valued, where we're, we're not creating a colorblind world, where we're not, we don't get to honor our differences, but that those differences actually make us stronger and brighter and more brilliant. Thank you, Carissa. Nadia, now to you, basically the same question I've asked um, uh, Alex. Uh, why should Asian Americans care about Black Lives Matter? Okay, hi. Thank you, Indra and Bill, and the Asian Art Museum for having us here. Um, and I'm excited about moving forward into the 21st century in the Asian Art Museum. Um, I'm also really honored to be here with my fellow panelists, who I really hold in high esteem, so I'm happy to be here with you. And I'm, I'm showing up as a representative of Asians for Black Lives. Um, we're a diverse group of people representing many Asian Americans and Asian immigrants to the U.S. We came together in a response from a call from Ferguson to start putting our bodies on the line and showing up in solidarity for black lives. We are making a stand about the war against black people. We're also linking our struggles with them as we're coming from countries resisting militarism, colonization, war, and state repression. That's right. 
And we also understand that our liberation is tied into the liberation of black people. And we also echo the demands that have come out of Ferguson, which you can look up on fergusonaction.com. And we're calling for an end for systemized racism and the white supremacy which perpetuates it. Asians are used by the system to uphold the myth of the model minority. Our successes are used to blame black people for poverty. Not only is this systematic and continues to play into a capitalist structure, but we also play into the part. And we need to address this within our communities, our role in upholding and being complicit in this system. Our communities have also experienced state repression within the United States. We all know about the Japanese internment camps in World War II, and more recently, after 9-11, the surveillance and detention of our Muslim, South Asian, and Arab brothers and sisters, who are also victims of racial profiling. And although these experiences are different, we can draw the connection, and we commit to standing in solidarity with all people who are struggling against state militarism. The war against black people is also perpetuated through all systems which have kept a white power structure in place. And that takes the form of mass incarceration, education, access to land, housing, and food, health care, water, all the basic necessities of life. So, we as Asians are charged with the task of creating spaces in our communities to address anti-black racism in our communities, to address the history and systems which continue to perpetuate the war on black people, and to show our support and solidarity to Black Lives Matter. We come from a legacy of Asian activists who have resisted anti-black racism and have made the connections between our liberation struggles. And our relative privileges in the U.S. have been gained by the struggles of black people, so we must respect, honor, and support their struggles. So Asian for Black Lives came together to publicly express our solidarity and put our bo bodies on the line when we shut down the Oakland Police Department woo, woo. on December 15th. Yeah, yeah. And since then, we've worked across our different identities and alliance with other third world um, activists and white allies and alongside our black comrades. And by doing this work, we are also building and strengthening our alliances and our relationships and trust, and thereby building a stronger movement beyond our own identity politics. So what I just spoke was some of the principles that have been laid down by Asians for Black Lives. And we've also developed some protocols by which we do the work. Um, we have a WordPress site up, it's a4bl.wordpress.com where you can read more in depth about that. But I just want to let you know about some of our protocols by which we're working. Um, we are embracing frontline black leadership and centering blackness. We're organizing our people. We're building trust and practicing transparency. We're moving boldly and swiftly, taking risks, making mistakes, and sharing our lessons and learning from our lessons to make it better for the next time. And we're embodying self-care and humility, community accountability, and collective healing. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Adachi, you are an insider to the criminal justice system here in San Francisco. And this is not a specific comment on the San Francisco criminal justice system, but we would be curious to hear um, what, from your perspective, could be done, can be done, to close the gap between the communities that feel victimized by the system and the system itself. An insider. <laughs> wow. I, like many of you, became a public defender because I was an activist. Uh, I see Robert here, Nancy, 
We worked on a case of a Korean man who was convicted in San Francisco in 1973 named Cho Soo Lee. And we worked on his case for five years to get him off of death row. And we did the power of the community and good lawyers. And that's one of the reasons I became a public defender. And uh, it's beautiful to see so many of you here because I think the question that we're here to answer is do Asian people think black lives matter or think black people matter? And you know, when I got the invitation to this thing, I, I, I was afraid. I thought there might be five people here. But I mean, the fact that you all are here and we have the diversity of the crowd, and I, I'm sure the other 300,000 people, Asian Americans in San Francisco, would have been here. You know, we got to reach out to them. You know, we, we you know we got to get people engaged because I think, as everyone has said, the struggle, you know, for liberation against oppression is 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 a struggle of all people, of all people. And working in the criminal justice system, I've been a public defender since 1986, and. I became a public defender because I wanted to be a people's lawyer, I wanted to, to make a difference. But I realized almost immediately that the system is set up in a way that people can't get justice. That even if you want justice, you can't get it unless you can afford it. When I started as a public defender, we had caseloads of 300 people per lawyer. That's like take everybody in this room. And that was my client base. And as public defender today, you know, I've tried to change that by making sure that we have reasonable caseloads, that we're able to do good quality representation and we have much more staff. But let me tell you, <clears throat> the reality is in terms of justice for people of color, particularly black people and Latino people, it hasn't changed at all. In San Francisco, where we like to think of ourselves as being progressive, our statistics and disparities are worse than Ferguson. We have less than a 6% population of African Americans in San Francisco because of gentrification and a lot of other things. Yet our jail population is 56%. If you are black, you have three times the chance of being stopped for a traffic violation, seven times the chance of being arrested. If you are an African American girl and you're arrested in San Francisco, you account for one third of all of the rest of black girls statewide. And you are 50 times as likely to be arrested in San Francisco than you are anywhere else in the state. If you are <clears throat> in front of a judge and they're sitting bail, your bail is gonna be on the average 25% more <clears throat> if you're African American. Your plea bargain is gonna be between seven and eight months more and you're more likely to be offered a prison sentence. If you happen to go to a jury trial, if you happen to go to a jury trial, because there ain't no black people on a panel, you know, because of the, the, the population is, is, is so low, then chances are you're gonna get convicted. Why? There's a study that was just done by Duke University that said all, well, a jury without any African Americans on it is 16% more likely to convict. Uh, than one with one African American just on the panel. And if you're sentenced, if, if you're sentenced in the US of A, there's a 30% chance that you're gonna get, you know, more time than your, your white counterpart. So I know this is all bad news, and, you, and you're thinking, you know, what can we do about this? But the, the reality is that the system ain't gonna change unless, you know, people make a change. And that's why if you get that jury summons to, 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 to serve on jury du duty, do it, you know? If you get the opportunity to speak up on racial justice issues, you know, do it. And uh, you know, you all are here today, but we gotta start getting out there and talking to our, our friends and our neighbors. And so, so they understand, there's that song by, you know, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, the old song, Wake Up Everybody. And that's what we gotta do, you know? We gotta wake up, these problems, have been here. How many of you have, have read the Ferguson Report? I know it's 109 pages, but it, it's a worthy read. It'll teach you more about, you know, what Malcolm used to say about black people getting more hell than anyone else, you know, than, than anything else you, you could read. And it, it's, it, it's a stunning wake-up call. Not so much because of what it says about Ferguson, but what it says about this entire country and, and what's happening. USA Today, 
uh, said there are 1,500 police departments in the United States that have worse uh, racial statistics than Ferguson, including San Francisco. Uh, Jeff, that's uh, some pretty remarkable numbers that you offered to us. I'm wondering whether any of the other panelists uh, have some thoughts on what might reduce those numbers, what would make the system more responsive to the communities. Anybody? <clears throat> um, well, I, I think the system is working exactly as the way it was intended. Um, and that is um, to oppress people of color. The system was built on white supremacy. Um, and so until we create new systems, this system is going to continue to operate um, in this way. Um, I think one of the things that folks in Ferguson did pretty early on was to say, to make the call that you're not standing just with Ferguson, but that you need to be lifting up what's happening in your own communities that reflects the same kind of crises that are happening in Ferguson. Um, so when I was an organizer in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco police were racially profiling Latino men in the hopes that they were undocumented and they would be able to tow their cars and sell their cars to in, in the auctions to beef up San Francisco's coffers, right? So this is the same thing that folks were doing in Ferguson. You know, Brother O'Shane Evans was murdered in San Francisco, right? So in San Francisco, in Oakland, right, lifting up Alan Bluford, lifting up um, Oscar Grant, that Ferguson is everywhere um, and as long as we continue to operate in ways in which put band-aids on a, a completely broken system um, we're, we're going to continue to lose so I think we need to be really creative in the ways that we think about what what our liberation looks like and how do we build alternative systems that really begin to heal us um, and provide the tools that we need in order to be thriving folks Alex or Nadia, you want to add anything or reflect on uh, what Jeff was saying with regards to the disparities in San Francisco and the, how the criminal justice system works? You don't have to if you don't want to. Yeah. yeah, I guess the things that I want to just lift is that all the things that Jeff said about San Francisco was happening for, for, for a very long time, right? And we're in this moment where these kinds of issues are finally lifted and visible. You know, it's like solidarity with black and Asian folks has, has always happened, but now we're lifting that, right? So I really think in terms of the system and the kinds of alternatives that people are thinking about, it is actually about countering and transcending the kind of pessimism that exists in society. The way that capitalism really splits us up into different identities and makes us fight against each other, it really makes us not believe that there are any other options. Like we organize uh, low wage workers in San Francisco who don't get paid minimum wage. And even when they know they're not getting paid minimum wage, it's like, well, it's not worth it because I know what the minimum wage is actually, I just don't think there's any hope to get it. And so through my organizing at, the, at CPA the last 10 years, people know what's up, right? You know, people know what's wrong with the system. People just don't have hope. And we're in this moment right now that people have political imagination. We've got a movement that is centering young people, centering black folks, right? And why is that strategic is because Right now, and I think historically there's a reason why the black movement has been decimated, is because a black-led movement is gonna have the best chances to lead for all of our liberation, right? And, and the system knows that, right? And so that's why it's very easy to pit Chinese immigrants against black people, you know? And it's, it's very easy for black people to say, oh, these immigrants are coming and taking my jobs. And then, and then it's for, for our folks, it's like, oh, you know, the black people are always robbing us, right? And you know, these are things that are lived experiences, it's just true, but we have to look at the larger system at play. One of the things that's happening right now with Black Lives Matter is that it's beyond just policing, right? Policing is the entry point. 
The indictment of one cop is the entry point. Black Lives Matter is like building a movement so we're deepening our consciousness across the board, you know? It's like the fact that I can talk to my parents about Black Lives Matter, good or bad, I mean, <laughs> the fact that we talk about it is a big deal, right? Our young people, right? There are Asians for Black Lives kind of groupings all across the country. And through our national work, we're actually working with a lot of activists that really they're not, they're not from organizations. They, they, they work in the community. Some are teachers. I mean, there's an opportunity right now that is expanding our, our imagination. And I feel like that is kind of the focus because with that expansion of our imagination, we can actually imagine alternatives. Thank you. Uh, I want to stay one more round, or how, however many of you would like to ask, uh, answer this topic. One of the so-called reforms that one hears to improving the system, whether it's criminal justice, political education, or whatever, is to better integrate it. For example, um, we hear the statistics on Ferguson. It is two-thirds black, but the police department is only, what, three officers are black out of a force of 50. The implication there is that if more black people served on the police force, that things would get better. Let's extend that out to the political community or the business community or the education community, which, have, which has seen over the last 30 or 40 years more integration, more women, more people of color in positions of power, including the White House, or police chiefs, or mayors. Does that, in your opinion, help, or does it not make a difference to racial injustice? Anybody? Well, how, how many of you read about the, the racist Texas from the San Francisco Police Department? We talk about lynching, black people, whiteness, saying something about, uh, you know, uh, killing people, you know, for fun. I mean, and it was interesting because we found out about that when the FBI, in response to a federal corruption trial, our office had uh, exposed these police officers who were breaking into residential hotels without warrants and stealing people's property. And uh, the way that we discovered that about that is that, you know, our clients were telling us that this was happening, but the judges wouldn't believe, the DAs wouldn't believe, the cops would go up there and tell a different story. And so we went to the hotel and we got uh, video evidence and we broke that out. And it showed that the cops were breaking in people's rooms without warrants. And one of the videos even showed the cop putting his hand over the video and he pulled it away you know, right as they were breaking into somebody's room. And of course, you read the police report. They said, oh, we knocked on Miss Smith's door, and she said, come on in. And it was only through that that, you know, we were able to show that these officers were lying. And we, we ended up getting over 100 uh, cases dismissed. But that resulted in this federal corruption trial. Well, it turns out that one of the cops who was uh, convicted, who was a sergeant in the police department, his name was Ian Furminger, uh, had all these racist texts on his phone where, you know, he was conversing with four other, you know, police officers, uh, active police officers who are on the force right now. And, you know, if you haven't seen the text, you should look at them because it's, it, 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 you know, for anyone that thinks that San Francisco, you know, doesn't suffer from racism in the police department, you've got to read them texts because it'll, it'll give you a whole different perspective of what's happening. But you know what? I, I talked to somebody who called my office today, and he was actually harassed by one of the officers who was involved in the texting scandal. And it's just a couple of minutes, I'm going to play it for you. Please tell us your name. Hi, my name is Michael Gebrezus, last name G-E-B-R-E-Y-E-S-U-S. -E now, you had, had reported an incident uh, that occurred uh, some years ago. Can you tell us what happened to you and, and when it occurred? Uh, yes, and I'm about... Mid-January 2007, I was leaning against an ATM on Market Street, and two officers uh, pulled up. I locked eyes with one of the officers, and I turned my head away. I continued to look down at my phone. Both officers get out the vehicle and approach me. Hey, what are you doing here? And I told them, nothing, chilling. 
And then they end, end up searching me and pull a CD out of my pocket. The CD was the artist named JT, the bigger figure, and they, I guess the artist misspelled the word on the, on the album cover, so Mr. Schwab said, these niggers and monkeys can't even spell. All they do is sell drugs to put out their music. So, long story short, he takes me to jail for uh, a misdemeanor violation. As we're going down 6th Street, he starts ranting about monkeys and niggers. We're going down 6th Street, he's pointing at people that are down their luck, people that are sagging their pants, and I'm getting mad right now just thinking about it, and I, 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 was, I was terrified, I was scared. He's calling me, like, everybody we drove by, like, this nigger right here, this monkey right here. Yeah, these monkeys have nothing to live for. And you monkeys have no home, no upbringing. I say, yeah, I have a home. He turns and says, well, not you, not you. You're different. I can tell by the way you talk. You know how to pronunciate words. But the rest of these, we know these monkeys I'm talking about, Michael. These niggers, I'm after them. And I, I was frightened. I was, I was scared to speak. Like, he can easily turn down this alley and kill me, you know? I was scared. And I remember going into the station. And I remember looking. His partner never said a word the whole ride. I remember going to the station. And the partner whispered to me, keep your head up, man. And that, that, I almost cried when he said that. Like, you're not going to speak up? against this guy that's saying this, you know? And, I don't know, and I know it's him because I saw him in 2011 on YouTube with the skateboard incident, and that name, I'll never forget that name, I'll never forget his face. Do you remember his, his badge number? But, but, you know, I mean, one of the points is that, you know, with the police department, you got this code of silence, and they call it Thin Blue Lion. And one of the things that I was at the Board of Supervisors today, trying to get the, 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 the Board of Supervisors to, to pass a rule that requires officers who witness misconduct, who are aware of this kind of express, explicit bias to say something, right? I mean, you know, the police are supposed to protect us. You know, they're not supposed to be protecting their colleagues, you know, who are engaged in breaking the law. Anybody else? <clears throat> Again, um, the question of having some uh, diversity. people of color in leadership yes. positions of these institutions. Yes. Um, so m my deepest belief is that if every white police officer had a black best friend, they would still engage in the ways that they do. Because we're talking about a system, right? It is complicated by individuals who are racist. Um, and the system wants you to think that that is the depth of racism. That there's an old white guy somewhere and he's calling black people niggers. And that's bad. And that is racist. And that is what we need to deal with. But in actuality, we're talking about a system that is intentionally oppressing people of color with the emphasis on black folks. And so to change the players and not the game does not work, right? Nadia, Alex, you want to address that at all or I'll come up with another question? Well, I mean, I think... It's true, I don't think that integrating the police force is the answer to anything because it is the system and the system is there to uphold a capitalist structure. Right. So, so for instance, um, if folks are familiar with uh, drugs, so there's a drug called crack cocaine. It's predominantly um, seen as a black drug. And there's a drug called um, powder cocaine, which is uh, predominantly seen as a white folks drug. Um, so up until fairly recently, um, the sentencing was 100 to 1. So if you got caught with crack, you would get 100 times more consequences than if you got caught with cocaine, which is a drug that folks um, consider to be a, a white folks drug, right? So that is a way in which, so it doesn't matter who the police pulls over, if that is the law, the way that the law is written, then that is part of the system, right? Right. Okay. Um, I want to move to a slightly different angle on our discussion tonight, and the, the term model minority has been used a couple of times, um, and uh, briefly Alex alluded to this angle that I want to ask uh, all of you to address. What if some and maybe many Asian Americans like being the model minority. They like being held up as success stories economically, not so much politically, 
but as the good minority, and among some of them, they may have anti-black feelings and or very strong pro-police feelings, and Alex alluded to that in the case of the police officer, Asian American police officer in New York. So I'm wondering what thoughts you might have if you had a chance to uh, speak to either a group of model minority Asian Americans who feel quite opposite the way you feel. <laughs> yeah, I guess a couple of thoughts on this is that first, the um, frameworks that we have about race in general, we're stuck. We're stuck in this kind of old racial logic that's from like racial formation, um, model minority, affirmative action. Those are all very important things still, right? But we're also entering into the 21st century. So I just want to say that we're, we're trying to talk about something and we don't have the tools to actually talk about it in a very good and complex way. I guess the first thing I would say just about um, the model minority is that there is a lot of, um, people have heard of Asian lumping before, right? And as Nadia said, as, as we were coming up together with uh, Asians for Black Lives and just talking about what does it mean for Asian folks to be in solidarity, we also just have to recognize that all of our folks are very diverse. Like this category is the largest category of ethnic differences, transnational differences, like you're putting Japanese together with Chinese and Koreans and then Laotian folks. So we just gotta know what we're working with is actually very limited, right? And so when we talk about the model minority, it actually invisibilizes a lot of the oppression that's happening in our own communities, right? So you can talk about workers, that's a very a much more obvious one. But you can also just talk about Southeast Asian folks, refugee folks who, who basically grow up with black folks, right? And they actually identify more non-Asian than they do Asian, right? But in this country, they get lumped and they get put into this category. And the model minority myth actually invisibilizes them, right? And so I, I just want to complicate the kind of notion around the model minority. Um, in terms of folks who just love the model minority, you know, like how many of you love it here? Is that why you're here? Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I think, I think it's, it's, it's interesting because like, again, we work with a lot of immigrants and, and I would say that this is a very important area of work that, that is um, lacking in the Asian American movement and it's working with the immigrant community because this is like 30% of the Asian American population, right? And this group of people don't really get to learn about US history. They don't get to learn about black liberation. They don't really understand all of the various laws and the, the benefits that happen and that have um, been gained in this country were from previous movements, right? And so when we, when we talk about it with our members, we actually do a lot of political education. We t talk about the Voting Rights Act. We talk about civil rights movement, the black power movement. And it's really important because what, what they hear, and they're very proud of, right? For example, like in a, let's say in the hospitality industry, right? Black workers are treated like shit, right? And black workers are disappearing. And one of, the, one of the union organizers in the hotels told me one time was that in the 80s, like most of the housekeepers were black, right? And as a way to weaken the movement, they literally were like, oh, well, let's try to slowly get rid of the black workers and we'll bring in the more, you know, the, 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 the subservient and uh, the quiet workers that will work really hard. So to bring in the 
Chinese and also the Latino workers. And you know, in some ways, the way they divide people up, they're like, okay, well, you know, you guys are so much better than the black workers. And it's like they say that to each other, right? They, they just do that. But there's a, there was a systematic attempt to basically say, well, you guys are the good workers and these guys are the bad workers, right? And so what we need to do is not only just educate people, but we actually help to bring different communities together. So we bring black workers, unemployed or employed folks with Chinese, Latino, Filipino workers. And that's what really needs to start. And you know, and about like a lot of this stuff about the system, again, I think most people know the system is broken, right? And I think for us as organizers is that we use these ways to change and reform the system as a way to politicize and deepen people's commitment to the movement so that one day we can actually reach a more revolutionary point, right? And I think that's important to say, right? Because a lot of us are, you know, you could say it's like, damn, down with the system. I mean, all of us are still in the system, right? And we got to do something. And, and it's not just about us doing individual acts. It's about us bringing people along, right? And that's what organizing is about. And I think, and it's a long-term process, but in a moment like Black Lives Matter, I think we use these moments as a way to really spontaneously take, exam take, take advantage of these kinds of um, disruptions in order to really deepen our consciousness. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to, to agree that, you know, we have to realize that if you're going to be cast as the model minority, you know, there's a cost to that. That's right. And it means that you're going to be marginalized. It means that you're going to be disempowered. Because just because you don't catch hell in one area don't mean you ain't going to catch hell in another, right? I mean, CPA will tell you that they track the victims of hate crimes. And you see per capita Asian Americans are victims of, of, of hate crimes overwhelmingly. When you look at sort of the glass ceiling and how far you can go or how far you think you go, you might think because you're Asian American, someone thinks you're good in math or they think you're good in science and so you, you know, you're gonna go, what happened to one whole league? You know, and, and, and so as we start looking at, you know, this whole mythology, you know, of being the model minority, you know, what does that really mean to us? I mean, name one major Asian American romantic star that you see on the silver screen. Oh, Jackie Chan, Chow Yun Fat? Nah, those guys, you know, they've been around for decades and they still don't get romantic leads, not over here. You know, Lucy Liu, or what kind of, you know. Uh, and, and, and so, when you think about where we are positioned as Asian Americans, yeah, you know, you might reap the benefits of, you know, people thinking you're smart or you get better grades. But you know, they did this test on I implicit bias, right? Because there's whole science now around what they call unconscious bias, which talks about the residue that's in all of us that defaults to our stereotypes and our own prejudices that we have. And so they, they did this test where they had two students in a room at, at Harvard emailing each other. And they were asking uh, one student to remember the other student's SAT scores. And when they attached a Asian female's name, they remembered her math scores as being what they were, but they remembered her English scores as being much lower. And that happened consistently. And so what, you know, what that tells you is that these implicit biases, they work both ways, right? I mean, in what I do in terms of being a trial lawyer, there's not a lot of Asian Americans. You know, there's not a lot of Asian Americans out there who are in court tried criminal cases. You know, there's, get, there, there's more, more than there were when I started, but there's still, are, so we need people who are gonna break those patterns, you know? And, and I welcome that. I was reading the other day about this Asian American law student at Bolt who's a porn star and he wants to be a public defender. And I was like, whoa, that's kind of mind blowing. You, you know? want to hire him, right? Yeah, there. I'm gonna yeah. give him a job in my office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's just interesting because we, when we think about this whole thing about the model minority, I mean, is that really what we want to be? 
Now, do you want to have a word on this? Yeah. Can I put this back in here? How do you do that? Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I can speak a little bit about being a South Asian and how South Asians really fit into this sort of model minority myth. And um, basically, in, in 1965, um, after the civil rights struggles helped to get rid of the Asian Exclusion Act, the, there was a big surge of South Asian immigration into the United States, including my family. And it was mostly professional class people who were invited in. And I see, and I have to admit that I have not grown up in a South Asian community within the United States. I, um, this is what I see, um, is that, the, that South Asians coming into, and you know, particularly Indians, are sort of buying into this sort of capitalist structure and this sort of white supremacist structure of upward mobility. This is the opportunity and sort of buying right into that American dream. And um, so they're kind of perpetuating this sort of capitalist idea. And in order to do that, you know, they need to sort of propel themselves up against another race or class, which means that eventually I gotta keep you know, someone down at the bottom so you can propel yourself up. Um, I don't have an answer to this about how to organize, you know, this high, this upper middle class, you know, Indian community that has recently come into the U.S. Um, I'd love to hear ideas if other people have ideas around that. Um, so, yeah, but I think, you know, once again, what we're trying to come from is like, talking within our communities and speaking out, I feel like um, with Asians for Black Lives, that us sort of showing up together and putting a face on the fact that we're like actually, you know, fighting this myth and trying to stand up in solidarity with black folks who actually, through the civil rights struggles, enabled a lot of Asians to immigrate to the United States, um, that I think that's the first step we can do. Carissa, I'm curious whether you have any thoughts on this model minority thing, since uh, black Americans usually are not called a model minority. I know. Why is that? <laughs> um, Except if you're in the NBA, I guess. Maybe. Right. So I would argue that everybody loses when we're talking about white supremacy, including white folks. Um, we're talking about... So, so in my opinion, what it calls for is for you to leave your culture, your identity at the door in order to fit into what they want you to fit into, right? So whether that's good education, being super smart, um, or whatever. So you'll never see like an Irish dude go to his Fortune 500 company or whoever wears kilts in like a kilt. Like you're not going to see that because that is not what is considered white, right? So you have to lose that identity. And so Asian folks are going to lose their agency and their culture if they engage in this process of model minority. Um, so I think it is, um, benefits us all regardless of who you are when you push back on this, I have to fit into this very uh, cookie cutter stereotype of who other folks want me to be because it's not authentic and it's not you. I want to get your thoughts on uh, stereotyping and racial profiling because uh, to me at least the situation in certain police departments or among uh, police officers, they probably do carry some stereotypes about people they run into. Uh, but I think stereotyping and racial profiling goes on fairly widely among a lot of us. Right. What can we do about stereotyping and racial profiling? Cut off your TV. Um, 
so I, I, I think the media has a very big role to play in the way that we engage in racial profiling and stereotyping. Um, so I do a workshop on um, implicit bias. Um, and we look at two articles that were written the same day following Hurricane Katrina. In one article, it is an image of a black boy. He's wading through the water, um, and he's holding something in his hand. Um, they refer to him as a boy, and they say that he is looting. Um, in, a se in the same day, an article was written with two white folks wading through water, and they say residents finding bread, right? So the media is very intentional in trying to paint a picture of who is worthy of our respect and our value. Um, if you watch the news the, and the criminal is black, the chances that they will put a very big picture up is great. If the criminal is white, um, the chances that they will omit a picture is very great. Um, there was an incident, a case um, in the Bay Area of a um, white couple. Uh, both of these cases are actually really sad. Um, a white couple who left their child in the car after they were doing laundry and the child died. Um, and two sisters who um, were outside while their kids were in the home. Their PG&E was out so they had a whole bunch of candles lit and the house burned down and those babies died. Um, so this, it was interesting because the stories were played back to back on KTVU News when I was watching it and this was some time ago. Um, and the white family was not charged with anything and the black family was charged with um, manslaughter. So the so basically we are there are very clear images of who black folks are and what our value is right so we can be sports players we can be comedians we can be um, musicians um, and those are the ways in which you we can be valued and if not we're criminals and that message is the overlaying message that's intended for a white audience and we see that too right so you get cases where black folks are like Latino folks are coming to take all our jobs or where Asian folks are saying, you know, black folks are criminals. It's in t there's an intention behind creating um, this friction amongst us um, because as long as we fight amongst each other, we don't fight against, um, you know, systems. And um, so I think, you know, biases are... Um, given the state that we live in, biases are normal, and we have to push back against them. Um, and again, the first step is to cut off the TV. So, um, in regards to racial profiling and stereotyping, um, I'm going to talk about the case of Suresh Bai Patel. Is, are you familiar with that case that happened in Alabama? He was a... He is um, an Indian grandfather. He was visiting his family in a white suburban neighborhood in Alabama, and um, he was walking through the neighborhood, and somebody, a neighbor called and said there was a skinny black man walking through the neighborhood, and she was f suspicious of him. So the cops came, and they were fueled by that, that he was a skinny black man, and up to no good, and so they, basically came up and harassed him and it was all on videotape and they slammed him to the ground and he became paralyzed. So there's a lot of like nuances around this case because after this the Indian government was agitating um, the, the US government and, and the governor of Alabama about this case that, the, that an Indian citizen had been um, a victim of police brutality. So the governor of Alabama apologized, and <clears throat> eventually this officer was fired and tried. And I think he is regaining, he's still paralyzed, he's regaining his, his mobility a little bit. But what's messed up about this case is that, like, first of all, there was this, you know, it's not this case about mistaken identity, right? That, like, oh, you know, he's not black, he's Indian, and he shouldn't have been you know, thrown to the ground. It's like, no, nobody should be thrown to the ground by the police. And, um, and so like, and also like, how many black people who are victims of police brutality get apologize, or apologies from, their, from the state governor or see that police officer fired and thrown in, or, and tried for, for that crime? Go ahead, Jeff. 
I mean, I, I, I do think that even our ideas about ourselves come from what we see on movies and, and TV. And if you think about it, you know, even when you're a kid and you're watching your favorite TV show, you're going to identify, you know, maybe with that one Asian character, right? Right now they got that TV show fresh off, fresh off the boat. How many people like it? How many people hate it? You know, <laughs> but it's there. It's something, you know. I see Kathy Lou here. You know, we used to work in the Asian American Theater Company. And one of the things that we really tried to do is put out, you know, really positive stories about Asians. And, you know, for Asian actors, it's tough. It really is tough. Because we don't have the clout at the box office. Don't get me wrong. Asians go see the movies. But you don't go see Asian movies, right? And, and that's what we, I think we got to learn from the black community. Because it was the same way for the black community 20 years ago. But they go out and support their own pictures, their own companies, and they got stars that they can bank on now. Will Smith can make a movie. Oprah Winfrey can pay for it, you know? And Tyler Perry, you know? I mean, you start naming them, and that's how they're getting positive images out there, right? I mean, Kevin Hart's in a movie with Will Ferrell. I mean, you know, it's kind of getting there, but I mean, you know, Chris Rock, right? And, you know, that's what we need to do within the Asian community. I, I made a film called The Slanted Screen a, a few years ago talking about how for Asian males, you know, they have a very difficult sort of catch-22 because when they get offered a role, they got to work and feed their families and they bet to play these terrible demeaning roles in most cases, right? And at, 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 at the same time, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's almost impossible, you know, for them to even be able to work and, and survive. And so we can't really come down on them, you know, when they're in that role that, that we don't exactly like. But, and, and it's, it's, it's even worse, worse for uh, Asian American women. Very much objectified, very much, you know, played, you know, in this subservient, you know, sexual way that's very disempowering, I think. You know, and, and Deborah Liu made a, a film called Slaying the Dragon uh, about Asian American women. You can see both of our films on Netflix. But the reality is that, you know, as, as Asian Americans, unless we start investing in telling our stories in the media, you know, and, you know, get the kind of face time that you need to develop a positive, you know, self-image, uh, you know, even ourselves are going to have difficulty, you know, believing in uh, who we are, you know, because it is self-perpetuating, right? When you, when you have children who don't see themselves portrayed in a positive way, it does impact the way you look at, you know, and each other, and, 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 and it limits what they think they can achieve. Alex, are you interested? Oh, Carissa, go ahead. Yes, I just have, I have one more um, thing that folks can do. Um, so, and, and just to respond, I think our black movies are really whack. They engage in a lot of colorism, right? So oftentimes the leading lady is like really light skinned and dark skinned sisters are not given opportunities to be romantic folks. So I think we still need to do some pushing around that. And then, um, uh, something that I think y'all all can do right this moment, or at least as soon as you leave here, is download the app next door. It is an online listserv for folks' communities, neighbor neighborhoods. Um, I live in Oakland, which is supposed to be a mad progressive city, um, and oftentimes folks on this listserv engage in super, super in-depth racial profiling. Two AAs walking down the street. Be careful, y'all. Like, that's literally what folks are posting. Um, so I encourage y'all all, it's a little green uh, picture, it has a little house on it. I encourage you all to download the Nextdoor app and get engaged in these conversations where it's very clear that folks are uh, racially profiling folks and push back on it. Uh, so Alex, I want to say something. Yeah, yeah, I want, I want to address the, the question, but right after you answer, we're going to go to questions from all of you. So please, we have microphones. Yeah, I just want to say something yeah. on um, but go ahead. on on racial profiling and stereotypes and how the system kind of needs to maintain these stereotypes to maintain this racial hierarchy, right? And so the media is like a big part of it. And I also just want to note that 
the model minority myth, as I'm reminded constantly by the good people at Change Lab and Ellen Wu, who is a professor, the model minority myth was cr created by Asians. And that's not something that has been very well researched, but Ellen Wu did write a book on this. And, and I, the reason why I bring it up is because there are a lot of inherent anti-black racist tendencies and kind of um, marginalization within the Asian community. And a lot of it does have to do with class differences. And so the model minority myth was created by a certain class of Asian Americans that really wanted to be complicit to the system. Right, and so that's just that's just one point that I just want to make. And the other thing too is just that a lot of times when we see an Asian American who's not acting quote unquote Asian, you know, it's like this person's not Asian enough. Like there's also black enough and all that kind of stuff too. But I think in the Asian community there is a tendency to really disown Asian people. And I was mentioning this before, right? So with the case of Errol Chang, you know, he had a mental illness. And mental illness in our community and probably many com communities is taboo. So I'm sure a lot of folks never really treated Earl as Asian, right? So let's just think about that, right? And there's another case of a Cambodian brother, Prelith Prelong, who, who got into a little fight with his coworker at a chocolate factory here in San Francisco. And he had a, a box cutter and he ended up accidentally cutting his coworker and he just ran and and when the cops found him and saw him they cornered him and they shot him right and i'm sure in that situation too prelith was not really considered asian right so you knew you know where i'm going this a lot of it is the media i'm not i'm not giving that a pass, I just want to say to within our own communities, what we do is like we try to preserve a certain kind of identity, and this gets into the model minority as well. We create these kinds of boxes that actually disowns people in our own community. Thank you, Alex. So it is, the panelists have said a lot of very interesting things tonight, which I hope will provoke some comments and questions from all of you, so I see somebody approaching the microphone. So that's the process we're going to use. Uh, please line up if you have a question or a comment. Please. I, have a com I have a comment. I am so thankful that the Asian Art Museum is breaking ground by having a great dialogue like this. I'm also happy that people were listening so intently. So I just want to say, I just finished a film called 14 Dred Scott, Wong Kim Ark, and Vanessa Lopez. We screened it in, at the uh, Missouri History Museum. So at the end of February, I was in St. Louis and Ferguson. An African-American gentleman in the audience was so moved, he asked me if he could take me around St. Louis and Ferguson. And I was more than shocked. I mean, I knew that there were racial divides, but it is really built, not to you know, disrespect you, but it's really black and white there because it's a very small Asian community and an even smaller Latino community. Um, I was so thrilled to be part of this film because I got to be on a panel with Lynn Jackson, a great, great granddaughter of Dred and Harriet Scott. And what we need to do is take back our history. It is American history. You know, in Arizona, they've banned ethnic history. That's, that's American history. It's not ethnic history. So I want to say, um, if we get rid of, and pun intended, whitewashed history and integrate everybody who has made this fabric of this country, I don't think we'd see the problems because you know what? Our children would be able to embrace role models of every color, every background. And once we're able to do that, that's how we break the system. And so uh, our film will be, we, we did a little sneak preview in October. We're gonna show it in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Center. It's gonna be in DC in June. Hope to be back in the fall in San Francisco. Um, and my great thrill was to be with Lynn Jackson, a great, great granddaughter of Dred and Harriet Scott. As you all know, the 14th Amendment gave freed slaves citizenship status. Um, and that was in um, 1868. In 1873, Wong Kim Ark was born in San Francisco, but on a trip back from visiting his parents who had since gone back to China in 1896, he was not let off the ship. The Chinese-American community got together, rallied around the community during the Chinese Exclusion Act, hired um, attorneys, and the case went up all the way to the Supreme Court. So in 1898, it doesn't matter where your parents are from. If your butt touched U.S. soil as soon as you came out of the womb, you are a U.S. citizen. But you know what? We still have to fight for what 
citizenship means. So please don't give up your right to vote. We need to get out there and vote too. And in spite of having just 6% of African Americans in San Francisco, and I grew up when the town was much more diverse, we have an African American woman who is president of the Board of Supervisors. We have London Breed, and we also have Shimon Walton, who just got elected to the school board. He came from poor circumstances, but he got enough votes to now sit on our school board and make changes um, with some of our at-risk children. So thank you for being here. Keep up the good work. I hope everyone else joins, and let's have role models of all different backgrounds. Please tell us your name. Oh. Julie Sue, S-O-O, -O, not to be confused with my friend, who is much more distinguished, Julie you, who is our state labor commissioner. Remember her when there are labor issues. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience? I don't know. Is this working? Ever. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. I guess um, so. It's kind of a vague question, but recently I was at a talk for Dalit women, Untouchables, as they're commonly known, and I was talking about Asians for Black Lives, and the woman on the panel asked if she. Well, her question was have you guys in the South Asian community talked about caste with your members? And I said, no. And then she said, well, how can you talk about black lives if you're not talking about South Asian caste, like the big topic that no one ever wants to discuss? Because when you leave India, when you leave wherever, you just replace the bottom caste with whatever caste is the lowest in the country that you move to which made so much sense, and so she was pushing us to think about doing an action that was around caste and black lives, which made so much sense theoretically, but then when in practice it just seemed so confusing. But she was making a good point that we haven't organized our own communities around all these deep-seated immigration things that we brought with us from our countries of origin, and then now we're talking about black lives but haven't talked about the other stuff. And there's just, it just, it gets, I don't know what the question is, but it's, I'm getting confused around all this stuff, if that makes sense. Anybody want to respond at all? You don't have to, but I'm just curious. I'm glad you brought that up, Salima. I actually had it in my notes to mention that Indians need to really talk about dismantling caste oppression too, you know, as far as what the work that we do within our communities. I think it's a great point. It would be great if other people, Carissa or someone, had some, some ideas around that. Um, you know, but um, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. The gentleman at the microphone. All right. Um, my name is Robert Kikuchi Ngoho, and my wife Nancy Wong. We're the co-directors of Ethnotech. We're an Asian American storytelling kinetic story theater company. And uh, what I want to say, there's a lot of um, well, here. What we need to look at is the really the long haul picture. I'm glad you brought up some of the historical facts about what's going on because this this war against races has been going on for quite some time and 1492, possibly. Um, in this, uh, we've been doing a story about the Chinese Americans, that, uh, the Chinese that uh, landed and shipwrecked. Uh, they were teenagers that uh, got on a junk boat in 1850s and landed in Monterey and were shipwrecked. But what I wanted to say about this is that when people come to this country, they come here with all that hope and all that, that dreams. And of course, in a country that was, was, was just seething with racism and built from the get, that we, we people needed to find partnerships. In the story that we're telling, uh, there, the partnerships happened between First Nations people, the Chinese were, were helped out of the, um, their shipwreck by the Esalen Rumson Nation, First Nations of Monterey. They found partnerships with the Mexican uh, uh, rancheros and, and the merchants there. They found partners even among the Lofan community, the white people that were, were in, in support of all the anti-Chinese laws that were being passed. So even back then, in the 1850s, all the way through the anti-Asian immigration laws, that there were partnerships happening. And so what we're happening here, what's here now, it's, again, it's leading to this point. And Black Lives Matter is that, is that fire that needs to remind us that it's not about one color and one color separate, but it's about mm -hmm. And truly this, this fabric that we're weaving a strength with. So um, if you want to see more about this, we are doing a play at Fort Mason on May 23rd and 24th called The Red Altar. So Thank you, Robert. Yeah, and, and Question over there? Um, Hello. Oh, oh hold on one second. So, so 
um, just responding to, to what the homie said around caste systems. Um, so I think it's important for us to think about how not only um, what Black Lives Matter means in this country, but how is the work that we're doing moving forward liberation in other countries um, where our engagement in capitalists capitalism and capitalist systems are perpetuating the oppression of our brothers and sisters in other countries. Um, and so I'm not too familiar with the term caste. I promise you I'm going to read some more on it. But I think that um, in order to engage in our liberation, we cannot be engaging in um, in arenas and ways that exploit folks in other countries um, because that that just repeats um, the systems, right? So as we begin to um, engage in what a liberated world looks like, we have to make sure that we're not replicating um, the systems that already exist. Hello, my name is Toshi Hu. I'm really grateful that we're having this discussion here. Um, just wanted to comment on uh, all the police brutality videos that have just been kind of coming into public consciousness. Uh, you know, I'm very disturbed by seeing them, but I'm also very encouraged by seeing that these are getting out there into the consciousness and stirring up this kind of discussion and activism. But one thought that's come to mind and kind of what my question is about is, I heard Jeff talking about the thin blue line and how much the police are protect protecting their own. And to some extent, I can understand that reaction. Um, I heard Carissa talking about that it's not necessarily just about the individual actors, but the system. And one of my questions is that I've been thinking about is, um, is there an opportunity to find alliances with the police, actual like police organizations who want to be doing good? I've been very surprised with like how like stringent and, and rigorous the defensiveness of what they're doing. And I wonder sometimes if they're being called out because they're the, the most kind of public facing aspect of this and actually where we can actually film. We, we don't really necessarily can, we, we, people aren't necessarily watching videos of these court cases where the sentencing is happening, but we're seeing these very dramatic br brutality videos. So I wonder if, it, is there any opportunities to find alliances or you know, allies within police organizations that want to not be the fall guys for this entirely? Obviously they need to be held accountable, but they're, they're, to me they're, they're really kind of taking on the brunt of critique for a whole larger system. I mean, I, I think it's a very good question. When you're talking about conscious bias, I think, like, if you were at, well, I was at a hearing for the Board of Supervisors on the racist Texas, and everyone's there, you know, saying how horrible it is. Yet, you look at the numbers that I mentioned earlier, but those are horrible too. And who caused that? It just happened by itself. And, and that's why the unconscious bias is, in many ways, even more dangerous because if someone's going to be like, you know, spouting off racist stuff, I mean, at least you could figure out who they are eventually. It might take you 10 years. But with, with uh, the unconscious bias, it's really institutional racism. I mean, Huey Newton talked about that, you know, in the Black Panther Party, about institutional racism, that it, it was something that, you know, it doesn't take a person to wake up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going to be racist today, right? It would just happen. And I think that we do have to work with police organizations. We, one thing that we did at, at the City Hall today is we really pushed for training these, these officers on implicit bias. And what was amazing to me, we just found out that two weeks ago they canceled all the so-called sensitivity training. And then today, because of the pressure, you know, because there were black police officers who showed up and gave an emotional pitch as to why the San Francisco Police Department has to change. That was very powerful. It was coming from other police officers. But I think as a result of that, you know, they're able to push that, push that training through. So it's a start, you know. I mean, clearly there, is, there are laws, like Proposition 47. That went a long way to help decriminalizing certain crimes by making them misdemeanors rather than felonies. But there is a lot of you know, whether the three strikes law, which is still in effect for serious crimes, you know, whether it's the way that prosecutors charge cases, right? If any of you ever had someone charged in the criminal justice system, it ain't like law and order. I mean, they will throw everything at you that they got. And you're like, wait a minute, even if you did A, they're gonna charge you with B, C, D, E, and F. And that's a shock to most people, that that's how the system works. So yeah, 
We can work with law enforcement. We can form alliances. That's part of it. But the problem with institutional racism is so much deeper. Over here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordi, and I'm an organizer with Californians for Justice. Um, but I'm also a part of Asians for Black Lives, and my students are over there in the front. So a shout out to them. Um, I have a comment, and I also have a question. I mean, I want to answer my fellow Asian for Black Lives um, member who stood up here and talked about like caste systems, right, and kind of the, the complications, complexities, right. Um, and some something I came to understand is that we don't, even as an Asian American uh, community, we don't we don't talk about the elephant in the room, and that's anti-blackness. And that anti-blackness is rooted deeply, right? Whether it's not anti-blackness is only not about you know. Um, how the system, how we as people also fail to value, right, black lives, but it's also, it, it impenetrates all our cultures, all our, all our societies, like all our communities, right? Um, as a Filipino American, right, I even experience anti-blackness, whether through colorism or class, right, in the Asian American community. So I think that's something that like we as a community need to talk about, right, because it's not only being perpetuated in how we interact and how we treat the black community, but how we treat each other. Um, and so what I also wanted to ask with that in mind, right, is to, and I put it to all the panel, but to, to Carissa and to Alex, right, where do we go from here in terms of the work that needs to be done in terms of solidarity, right? Like how, what, what, is, what is it more that we need to do? So it's not only like we gotta show up for direct actions, but there's deep work that needs to be done in our communities, right? In terms of working together, in terms of making those bonds, because we're working against a system that's keeping us separate. Um, so to all of you, but specifically also to Carissa and Alex, like where should we go from here, you know, in terms of solidarity work? So there's a plan, right? <laughs> I think the, the moment itself right now is just very different than past movements where past movements have been very prescriptive. So we've been trained in some ways that we're looking for a plan. And I think that what's uncomfortable about it is that right now what we actually got to do is like, besides the direct actions, we actually got to get to know each other. Right? We gotta build with each other, have community. We gotta, we gotta do deep, courageous conversations. The way I've been trying to talk about it is, is that in this moment, we gotta show up for ourselves, like personally, our own people, the people we've marginalized, and also show up for black folks, right? And like, that's really important because there is a tendency, and I would say, I, I'd say some, I've been guilty of it before too, it's like, you, you want to jump onto the kind of trendy actions and, and it's like, okay, we're showing for black folks and this is like really cool stuff and that you, you kind of feel better and you look cooler, you know what I mean? But there's like really deep work that has to be done in our own communities, right? And you can do both. And I actually feel like because now the moment has gotten so much bigger, it's given us a lot more agency and, you know, so we maybe we'll watch less TV. I won't watch fresh off the boat this week, you know? And I wanna spend time talking to my mom or something, you know what I mean? So I just think that the, the moment itself is just beginning and, and it, we gotta come together to really build that. Um, so yeah, I would echo everything that Alex said and I would say that um, for me, one of the um, really important pieces in this moment is for us to vision together and dream together um, because we have acted so much in reactionary ways for such a long time of at least my organizing life that it has not given us a lot of opportunity to dream. Um, and that's how we build relationships and that's how we build community with each other. Um, and I think that that's gonna be a really important piece for us to sustain the work. Um, it's been, you know, when you shut down, I shut down the bar, I'm part of the Black Friday 14. So when you shut down the bar, when you shut down OPD, like the homies, or the federal building, right? Like it's been a lot of shutdowns and that's been really exciting. And it does, at least for me, provided some healing, a healing aspect to be able to, um, 
like like our elder Baird Rustin um, said, put our bodies in places so wheels don't turn. Like that's powerful, um, but just as powerful is being able to sing together and laugh together and eat together. Um, and so those are the pieces that are going to sustain us long term. Um, and to think of ourselves as co-conspirators um, and not just allies, but co-defendants that like we're in this together for the long haul. I was just going to uh, mention one con very quickly. Yeah. I was going to mention one concrete thing. We recently formed an organization called Public Defenders for Social Change. We had Black Lives uh, Matter rallies at all the courthouses in December. And one thing that came out of that is that we started a court watch. And so we have members of the public and students come in uh, like one or two times a month uh, to watch court proceedings and blog about it and talk about the injustices that they see. So if that's something that you're interested in, you know, definitely go to our website at sfpublicdefender.org and, uh, and contact us. And I think the other thing is, is that, you know, we have to recognize that we already have a, you know, common ground that we fought from. I see Greg Moore Zumi here who's done all kinds of work, you know, with the Malcolm X <coughs> Jazz Festival and, you know, uh, in, in Oakland and, uh, you know, you all know Yuri Kochiyama, you know, who worked, you know, with the Black Revolutionary Party in uh, New York City. So we already have this history, you know, it's just a matter of, 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 you know, making sure that we remember it, that we teach about it, and ultimately that we continue to struggle. <clears throat> I'm sorry to say we have room for time for only two questions, so why don't we go here and go to that mic and... I'm sorry for thank all you. you folks standing in line. Go thank, ahead. You, thank you, Mr. Wong. I, I want to make three quick points. My name is Alma Don't Robinson. I'm the director of California Lawyers for the Arts for a long time. Uh, we have a video on our website, two young people who are in our youth internship program with internships in the arts experienced um, harassment by San Francisco police, and they made a video about it. It's on our website. and. When one black police officer looked at it, he said, I can't believe this is still happening in San Francisco in 2014 when we, we showed it to him. And we want this, this video to be part of Police Training Academy. And he, he suggested that himself. A black girl wearing a, um, a camera over her neck in a photography program was stopped by the police. And they said, what are you doing with that camera? Where'd you get that camera? and they searched her backpack. It was terrible because it takes your whole self-esteem away from you. And we're trying to help build up these kids through arts activities and giving them a, a salary and a, and a place to go and to, and to be somebody. And here come the San Francisco cops, you know, heavy and into search with no, no particular reason. And then there was a kid who was um, arrested for a bus pass violation. So there's that. And then we're also doing a program on arts and corrections. We're doing a national conference here in San Francisco in June at USF. Hope you'll look at our website if you're interested. The point of that is to help us see people who are incarcerated as human beings who have potential. And many of them are coming back to our communities. So those of you who have an interest in this can help mentor them and help them find their way with very difficult circumstances so that they don't have to go back in order to have a home and a place and three square meals and all of that. Because our rate of recidivism in California is very high. Realignment pushed this as a result of arts and corrections uh, demonstration project and other things that we've been doing. The legislature said, hey, let's give more money to uh, California Arts Council. Let's look at arts and education. And so I, I think there is an important cultural piece here. It's beyond these things that we're doing, but we have to recognize the humanity <clears throat> in each of us and the potential. Thank so I really much. thank you for putting this together. It was thank very, very inspiring. Much. Thank you. Last question over here, please. Hi, I just want to say this. I'm really moved to see everyone here showing up for each other. Um, and I want to know, starting with Carissa, um, what have you seen or what do you want to see from the Asian American community as, in terms of solidarity? And then also maybe other folks if they want to share what, what, you know, what, how you envision that as well. Also, I thought the model minority myth was started in the Time Magazine um, whiz kids thing. But we you can should, talk about that later. I'm just, I'm, yeah, I thought that's where it started. You should read Ellen's book. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
Um, so I think Asian folks have been doing um, really amazing jobs in the groups that I've been engaging with, Asians for Black Lives and um, Third World for Black Power. Um, and some of the things that they've been doing is lifting up black leadership, um, making sure that black folks are central when they're making decisions about tactics and strategies. Um, I think it's also important for us to remember the phrase, steel sharpens steel, um, and that oftentimes we become sharper when we're critical and holding each other accountable, um, and that that's necessary, um, and that we need to be gentle with each other, that we all have growing edges, um, we all make mistakes, I make hell of them, um, and that through this process, we will learn to be fuller and healthier um, and to love each other up. Thank you for that, that was, that was great. And, um, and yeah, I mean, just thinking about like, um, you know, maybe some of the despair I had a little bit earlier, but I also feel like, you know, we've talked about the legacies that we've come from with Asian American, or Asian um, solidarity with black people throughout the ages. And, and, um, and so one of the things that sort of keeps me going and, and remembering sort of you know, our heritage of being freedom fighters and fighting oppression and fighting colonialism and using that as sort of reminding, at least in um, my Indian family and my Bengali family, to like remind people of like, this is where we came from as freedom fighters and it's in us to resist oppression. As far as like um, showing up in solidarity, um, it's, yes, a lot of mistakes can happen and, you know, I think what's been awesome is all the trust that's being built and the relationships being built and knowing that we're like holding each other through those mistakes and, and, and helping each other to sort of move forward through that. And um, I actually wrote this quote um, that might be appropriate now. Um, it, it's, well, I wrote down this quote. It's from Gihan Pereira, who's a South Asian activist in Florida with Florida New Majority. And I found this quote um, where he wrote about coming together with, um, in the National Organizing Alliance. He said, I desired to come together with all those great folks, not only to affirm our commonalities, but also to be challenged by them and to challenge them to venture towards the unfamiliar, to step on uncommon ground. I wanted to explore the gaps and contradictions in our own works and take a bold leap into the unknown. Yeah, I want, I want people to be able to, for folks who haven't really been able to participate in any kinds of actions and, and movement overall, I want to say that this movement actually is very humble. And it's a, it's a healthy movement where people do take care of each other. And, and, I, and I think that's a very important point to make because that's something that our elders have always said, wow, this is a different kind of movement. And it's actually important because we're learning from the previous generations. And so I just wanted to kind of lift some of the things of like, you know, people talk about a leaderful movement. There are many leaders and many of the people who are in this room could have been on this panel as well. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing people talk about is low, a low ego, high impact, and I think that's actually what we resemble as well, and that we really have a lot to offer, right? And what I wanted to, what I wanted to end with is just bringing people to action, because what we'd like to do as organizers is move people to action, and your opportunity is tonight. And we have a couple of things I just wanted to say. First is, um, there are these little flyers being passed around about justice uh, for Errol Chang, and I, I just want people to learn more about this case because it's been invisibilized in our own community. So Matt's there, and okay. So um, the second thing I want to like let folks know is that there is an action tomorrow at 7 a.m. at Grand and San Pablo in Oakland, and it's an eviction of Africa Town, a community garden. And the, um, it's, it's, it's a really important action and it's also important for Asian folks to show up because the landlord is actually Asian and that it's gonna be really important for Asian people to be there to show that kind of support. 
And then the third thing is um, we have these signs here that are to, not, we're not protesting right now, um, we, we have these signs. Um, there's been a national, a national call out from Akai Gurley's uh, family for more Asians to support and to show not like all Asians are supporting Akai Gurley, but to show that there is a diverse, there are diverse opinions about the case and not everyone is supporting um, Peter Liang. So if people want to stick around, just take, we'll have people taking pictures, you could do a little selfie and we're going to be putting up on a, on a Tumblr. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yes. And then, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. The final word, please. Um, I just also want to say that Asian folks have been throwing down for black lives for a long time. This is also not new, right? So when we're talking about, you know, CPA has a really long legacy um, where folks were throwing down with the Black Panther Party. When we're talking about um, folks nationally, Grace Lee Boggs, right? Folks have been throwing down for black lives historically. Um, and so I just want to lift those up and I want to echo um, that there are a lot of folks in this room who can be sitting up here um, because um, we are not a leaderless movement. We are a movement full of leaders. Thank you very much. Uh